Hello and welcome as we gather to worship God together and however you're joining us from this service. I pray that the risen Lord Jesus will bless us and speak to us as we worship him and listen to his word together. Easter Sunday may have been last week, but we're still in this season of Easter. We're still celebrating and marvelling at the wonderful news that Christ Jesus, who died for us, is risen from the dead. Let's come before him together now in our opening prayer. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for the wonderful news that Jesus is risen News that isn't just for one day of the year, but for every day of our lives. Thank you that everything changed because of Easter Day. That nothing has to be the same ever again. As we worship you today for all you have done, let the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection take root in our hearts so that we can be people of the risen King, living out his new life and sharing it with everyone we meet. In his name we pray. Amen. As we remembered on Easter Sunday last week, the fact that Christ Jesus died and rose again means God has made him Lord over all. Let's sing together of that wonderful news and praise him with the song, Lord, I lift your name on high. And let's come before our risen King with our own personal prayers. Let us pray. Praise God for everything that is special about Easter to you. Thank God for the difference that Jesus has made in your life.
ask God for his forgiveness for whatever you need it for today. Ask God for whatever it is you need or what it is you know that someone else needs. And just spend a moment quietly, recognising the presence with you of Jesus, the crucified and risen Lord. we draw all our prayers together in the name of Jesus who taught us when we pray together to say our Father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. bring him praise come all and tune your hearts to sing to the morning star of grace from the shifting shadows of the earth we will lift our eyes to him where steady arms of mercy reach to gather children
full or empty hands find the riches of His grace. Over all the world His people sing, sure to show we hear them call. The truth that Christ through every age our God is all in all. Rejoice! Our two readings today come from the New Testament and the first is from the first letter of Peter chapter 1 starting at verse 17. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defects. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply, from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. And our second reading is the story of Jesus meeting some of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And it comes from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? 
and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. May God bless to us the reading of his word today. He shouldn't have been there, of course. Jesus, I mean, he shouldn't have been there on the Emmaus Road with Cleopas and his friend. He'd been crucified two days before, something that was hardly a secret. Crucifixion was done to be as public as possible, and plenty of people would have seen Jesus die, would have heard his final words from the cross before he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And people who had been crucified tended to stay in their tombs or the bit of ground where they were buried they didn't tend to get up and start walking around as if nothing had happened even if by some miracle someone survived crucifixion and it's hard to see how they could have done then they would have been so traumatized and brutalized by what had happened to them that there's no way that they could have just started walking a seven mile road from Jerusalem to this village of Emmaus Jesus should not have been there but then Jesus should not have been on the cross in the first place not if he really was the one to redeem Israel the savior the messiah the Christ because if he was that person then he would not have allowed himself to be betrayed by a friend he would not have allowed himself to have been arrested and tried by the romans and the jewish authorities and he would not have allowed himself to be nailed to the cross and he would not have allowed himself to die no, if Jesus had been the Christ, the Messiah, the Saviour, he would have struck down his traitorous friend. He would have stood up against those who tried to arrest him and defeated the Romans. He would have called down armies from heaven and blown them all away and won a great and everlasting victory against them. Jesus did none of that he was betrayed he did allow himself to be arrested and crucified and he died and Cleopas and his friend must have known what it meant when someone who accepted the title Messiah ended up on a cross it meant failure it meant they weren't the person that they claimed to be and you can hear the sadness the regret, perhaps even the self-reproach in what they say to Jesus. We had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel. The implication, we were wrong to hope that. Our hopes were misplaced. Either Jesus should never have been on that cross in the first place, in which case something had gone horribly and disastrously wrong or they should never have begun to hope that he was the messiah in the first place but of course they shouldn't have been on the road to emmaus 
not if things had worked out. They should not have been on the road home. They should have been in Jerusalem that week because that should have been their victory week. The moment when Jesus triumphantly won God's victory against all Israel's enemies. The week when he established the kingdom of God amongst the nation and in the world. And they should have been there with him, helping to establish that kingdom and fight off Israel's enemies. They should have been taking their places in the new order and the new rule that Jesus had established. They should have been celebrating and praising God for this amazing victory. They shouldn't have been walking home in the fading light, filled with sadness and, and regret and the pain of dashed hopes. They shouldn't have been puzzling over this strange message from the women that Jesus' tomb was empty and angels were saying that he'd been raised. They should not have been allowing their hearts to be warmed by this stranger who walked alongside them and told them that this was how it had always meant to be. So they should not have been there, and he should not have been there with them. But he was, trying to help them make sense of it all, to see that what happened wasn't a, a terrible tragedy or an awful error that God had somehow managed to rescue, but the climax of everything that had gone before the point that everything was leading up to. He was trying to get them to see that however awful it had been for Jesus to be on the cross, that was what was meant to be. That however strange this talk of resurrection was, that was how it was meant to be. This, he was saying, was how Jesus was always supposed to be Messiah that this was what he was always supposed to do, that this was always how he was going to save his people, and that this now was where he was meant to be, yes, crucified, but now alive, more alive than he'd ever been, and bringing a new kind of life to them, to the disciples back in Jerusalem, to everyone who believed in him, and to the whole world. We have a saying as humans, everything has a purpose i think we often use it when things have gone dreadfully wrong and we're kind of trying to draw some reassurance and comfort from the situation everything has a purpose and it's often spoken of as a kind of christian belief but i'm not sure it's it's entirely biblical in itself the closest that the bible seems to get to that is saying that all things work for good for those who love god not that everything has a purpose but that god is there in everything good and bad working for our good and his good purposes but in this case maybe the saying is true the cross and the resurrection had and still have a purpose jesus's death was not an accidental tragedy hastily corrected by god through the resurrection it was truly meant to be. One of the most astonishing claims, perhaps the most astonishing claims that the first Christians made was that God had won his victory precisely through the cross, this sign of death, as well as the resurrection. Jesus was meant to be there on the cross for our sake and for the sake of the world. And the privilege of hearing and reading the story of the road to Emmaus is that we get to see when this was first worked out, when this was first spoken of, when this was first revealed by Jesus himself. And revealed is the right word. Cleopas and his friends didn't figure this out for themselves. You get the impression through the story that someone else is at work, keeping their eyes from recognising Jesus until the time is right, until they're gathered together for supper, and until he does what he did in the upper room, takes bread, blesses it, breaks it, 
and shares it with them. What greater sign that this was all meant to be could there be, that Jesus uses the signs of his death to reveal his risen self to the world, that that's the moment when their eyes are opened and when God shows them that it is true and that Jesus is risen. His death and his resurrection belonged together. Both were part of the plan, part of God's purpose. He belonged there on the cross and he belonged there in that room with them that night, revealing himself and then disappearing from them. This is the story of our salvation, the very beating heart of the good news, the gospel of God, that Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, willingly went to the cross and took on our sins and the sins of the world in order to take them from us that he faced the worst injustice so that God's wonderful beautiful justice could win out and prevail in the world that he faced and submitted himself to death so that death itself could be overcome and that against every expectation, every possibility that the world seems to offer to us in its all too narrow vision, that he rose again from the dead, that he became alive once more, sealing that victory and letting loose into the world new life and new creation. And our story, our gospel and good news, it's that this isn't accidental this wasn't just a particular turn of events that God happened to use in a good way that this was the plan and the purpose from the very beginning that God had laid the foundations the groundwork for this through his dealings in and with and through and for the people of Israel that he had made it known through the psalmists the poets and the prophets in what we call the old testament jesus belonged at the very heart of this and it was all the plan from the very beginning just as jesus belonged with cleopas and his friends just as jesus by his grace alone belongs with us or we belong with him now i haven't said too much in all of this about how we should apply this to our lives because what can you say if this is true then it can't just be a case of taking a lesson from this story and making it fit our lives no if this is true then we have to be asking god to make our lives fit in with what jesus has done but maybe there is something after they'd recognized jesus and he had disappeared from them Cleopas and his friend race back to Jerusalem to the other disciples and breathlessly tell them it's all true he is alive he is risen and he's shown himself to Simon the news is true perhaps we could learn to do the same to remind each other of this amazing gospel this wonderful news that christ died for us and is risen again and therefore he belongs with us in every situation good or bad not through cliches like everything has a purpose not through religious jargon not through empty platitudes not through just saying hey look on the bright side when there seems to be no bright side but through love and prayer and care for each other through walking with each other in every good and difficult time being the presence the love of jesus in our own flawed and broken way and showing them that he longs to be there with them by reminding each other that even in the darkest and hardest of times jesus belongs there and if Jesus belongs there, then life and hope and new possibilities belong there, even if we can't always see them. How can we learn to talk with each other 
in this way, to walk with each other in this way. And of course, of course, how can we learn to share this with the world? A world that is broken and suffering and in pain and all too often turns away from God, not seeing any place for Jesus with them in their sufferings, much less any answer to the world's sufferings. How can we show them that through the cross and the empty tomb, Jesus belongs there and that Jesus belongs there because he can bring what the world most desperately needs? How can we show them that Jesus doesn't belong up in the clouds, far off and away from all of this, but that he belongs right there with them? Jesus should have been there on the Emmaus Road with Cleopas and his friends. Jesus should be there now with the broken, the messed up, the sinners, the hurting, the betrayed, the grieving and the sick, whether that's us or anyone else in the world. Please God, reveal this to us. And please God, use this, use us to reveal this to others. Let's come before the risen Lord with our prayers for others and for ourselves. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, on that dark and doubt-filled road, you reminded Cleopas and his friend that what had happened to you was no accident, 
that it had been planned from the very start, and that through your death and resurrection, you were overcoming all that has gone wrong in our world and bringing new possibilities, new life, and new creation into our world. When we're tempted to doubt and despair, Lord, when the situations we face, the things that happen in our world seem to be overwhelming, walk with us, we pray. Reveal yourself to us in whichever way you choose, so that we might find your light and your hope guarding us and keeping us, and helping us to stand and walk with others who tread those same dark and doubt-filled roads. Lord, there are so many people who walk those roads right now, too many for us to mention in this time, it seems. Victims of war and violence in the Ukraine, in the United States, and so many other places. People who are forced to flee their homes and their countries and seek safety elsewhere. People whose lives have been upturned by inflation and economic trauma. And those whose situations were precarious even before this began. People who have lost someone whom they love. People who are preparing themselves to let go of someone close to them. Or who are facing up to their own death. There are those who know they have messed up. And those who need to know this so that they can change. Lord, these may be other people but they may be us, whoever they are. We ask that you will show yourself alongside them, with them, on those difficult journeys. Help them to see that you belong there with them and that the light and life you bring are available to them, whatever they might go through. And as always, we pray for those whom we love, and who are especially on our hearts today. We stand with them in prayer, just as we seek to walk with them in whatever they are going through. Bless them, and walk alongside them, we pray, and help us to be people who will reveal your light and your presence to them in whatever we do and whatever we say. In your risen name we pray, Amen. We close our worship together with the great triumphant Easter hymn, Christ is Risen. Alleluia. <laughs>
may he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. And let's share the grace together. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you, as always, for watching or listening to this service. Pray that God will bless you and somehow use you to show others that he lives and loves. Take care, and God bless you, and stay safe. Bye-bye.